Hi everyone, it's um, it's about the top of the hour. Um, I think we're about to get started. If you like, uh, people are putting uh, their name and, and where they're from in the chat, just as a, as a greeting. You ready to go? Um, so we'd like to start um, with a land acknowledgement. Um, my name is Mary Lynn, and I'm coming to you from my office at the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage at the Smithsonian. So I'm very close to the National Mall in Washington, DC. You're seeing a photograph of the mall here. Um, and uh, most of you probably know that the United States Capitol is surrounded by over a dozen tribal nations that thrive along uh, the Anacostia and Potomac River watersheds in the Chesapeake Bay area. Uh, in the states of Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware, and Washington, D.C. Uh, D.C. itself sits on the ancestral lands of the Anacostans, and, um, and their neighbors uh, are also the Piscataway and the Pamunkey people who continue to live in this area and care for these lands today. Um, today, there's roughly 4,000 or more Indigenous people who call Washington, D.C. their home, at least temporarily, and we honor all of them. And, and thank you all for coming to this uh, presentation. So, um, as I said, I'm Mary Lynn, and I am the Curator of Language and Cultural Vitality at the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. Um, I lived and worked for many, many years in Oklahoma. I still consider that my heart home. <laughs> so it's good to see a lot of you coming from that area as well. Um, and I will pass it to Haley Dardar. Hi, Alito, Sechipiat Haley Dardar. Hi, my name is Haley Dardar. Um, I am a member of the Homo Language. I'm sorry, Homo Language. <laughs> rolling right into it. Uh, the United Homo Nation in, in South Louisiana. Um, and we work, I work on the Homo Language Project. It just you know, flows out. But um, I'm also the Language Vitality Project Coordinator um, at the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage with Mary. So I'm uh, really glad to meet everyone today. So today we're going to tell you a bit about what we do in this Language Vitality Initiative. But to get a better idea, it's good to kind of put the lens out a little bit and talk about what the Smithsonian Institution is as well, and some of the other ways that the Smithsonian may be able to help you. So the Smithsonian Institution is a very large um, organization. Uh, many people think of just what we call the castle, the very old original building in the red stone um, that looks like a castle. Uh, but there's really 21 museums, galleries, gardens, and of course the National Zoo that has the pandas. Most of the museums are in Washington, D.C., but we also have one of the um, National Museum of American Indian in New York City, and we also have the really large building with all the rockets and everything in, in Virginia as well. There's three cultural research centers. One of those is the Asian Pacific American Center. Some of you who may be um, in Hawaii or Guam may um, know about APAC, as we call it. There's also the Latino Center, which is now shifting over to actually be the National Museum of the American Latino. So that will move up to the museum category soon. And then the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage that we're situated in and we'll talk more about as we go along. There's also eight international research centers, libraries, and archives. Some of you may be familiar with the Arctic Studies Center, which is housed um, in the Anchorage Museum or partners with the Anchorage Museum. It's housed in, in Anchorage, Alaska. And then also the National Anthropological Library, which holds a lot of the language materials that have ended up at the Smithsonian um, in a variety of ways over the years. There's also 13 or more research programs, and one of those is Recovering Voices that we will also talk about as well as we go along. So you can see it's a really big institution, um, and we're a small part of it, but we feel like a, a very good part of it. <laughs> so the center has the, well, we do several things at the center. One of them is the Folk Life Festival. It started in 1967, so it's over 50 years old. It was started to bring the musical instruments and the material culture out to the people. 1967 was part of the cultural uh, reno 
revolutions that were going on in the United States. And, and the current, the secretary of the Smithsonian at that time really wanted to bring things out to the people. It was also a tumultuous time, uh, the civil rights movement, AIM, a lot of things were going on. And so the Folk Life Festival also started as a place for people to get together and talk about really important issues. Uh, so we have what uh, is called the narrative stage or stages where we bring groups of people together to talk. And these are open to the public who is walking along the mall at the time, uh, gets to talk with people and ask questions as well. During the early years, there were quite a few. Um, well, we co concentrated on uh, different states to have them present what their cultural heritage is. And at the same time, we also did uh, most of the tribes or at least tri uh, geographical regions, cultural areas. And so the first 10 years of the Folk Life Festival had a lot of native representation in it. Cultural vitality is um, where we are under the Language Vitality Initiative. It's a relatively new part of the, um, of the center. It's, so the festival, we, in order to do the festival, we have continuing relationships with a lot of the people that come to present their culture. Um, and so we wanted a way to really help as some of those communities continue cultural heritage practices in some areas of the world, even start um, uh, cultural tourism that was responsible that they had control over and things like that. So the cultural vitality program was started. And, um, and in that was the recognition that language is very, very important to uh, keep cultural heritage alive and also to keep people in some areas of the world from having to move into cities. If you keep your traditional cultural, traditional economic system alive, you don't have to move into cities where language and cultural loss takes place a lot faster. And language was very important to doing that. So language became part of that initiative. We have research and education, which really feeds into cultural vitality and the Folk Life Festival. And also we have Folkways recordings. So that's kind of our musical area. Folkways is, has the largest collection of world uh, folk music. And, and it's also a record label. So if you know of really cool music that's happening in your community, the Folkways has been a record label that's really started out. A lot of people who were not known before got their start at Folkways Recordings. And then we also have the Ralph Rinsler Archives, which actually houses the archives for the Folk Life Festival, for the Folkways and all of our research. So for example, in a Folk Life Festival, um, everything will be recorded. So all of these early discussions between with uh, representatives from tribes in the 60s through like uh, 79, 85, those are all recorded. And we were trying to get them um, all digitized, accessible with really good information that comes from you all about really what's in there, who's really doing the talking and stuff like that. And we still do this today. So for example, last year, um, uh, we had a, a folk life festival on on uh, the environment pretty much. And we had young people from um, Ani Dakota College come for a week and all of their stuff is recorded as well in that archives. So I'm gonna pass it on to Haley now. Yeah, and I wanna talk a little bit about um, how cultural vitality, um, how language vitality, our program sits within this, this larger place of cultural vitality, which is in this larger place of the Center for Folk Life which is in this larger place of the Smithsonian. <laughs> and, the, and the goal of this is to really kind of give you an understanding of where we fit in things before we start talking about um, some of the things that we're doing and that could, could be directly um, supportive or relevant to the work that you guys are working on. But to just finish off the frame, um, cultural vitality, within cultural vitality, there, there are kind of three different um, strains of work that are happening. First one is cultural industries. Um, the goal of this project is to, to reinforce and develop existing community uh, cultural practices. Um, this is through trainings, workshops, apprentice programs, network building, and, and access to, to larger market markets. Cultural industries project mostly focuses on tangible artifacts of, of craft. 
The other program that's uh, that's related is Mother Tongue Media. Um, there's a lot of crossover between all three of these groups, um, but Mo Mother Tongue uh, Media is just tries to cultivate multilingual media within uh, cultural organizations. So this is really trying to connect different groups and organizations that are trying to create media within their mother tongue or about their culture in the community, um, and trying to create a hub and a spot for people to to connect on 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 creating public and global expressions of their work. Um, and kind of in between those two is language vitality. Um, the goal of this program is to support indigenous and minoritized languages and their communities, focusing on how we can, we can uh, what communities are requesting and what do they need and how can we leverage Smithsonian resources or the, the general um, you know, Smithsonian brand to support these different language communities and efforts like what you guys are doing with, uh, with some of you guys are working on within a and &E. Within language vitality, we kind of uh, kind of group things into four different strains of work, and we're going to give uh, better examples of each one of these as we go along. But and we're also, you know, pretty open to new ideas. Uh, this project started uh, in March of 2020, so it's it's coming up on its third year here, and so we've really it's it's really been a it's been a time to build this out, and uh, we're really looking forward to seeing where this goes. Um, the main pro uh, project is to advocate for scale with uh, and train indigenous and minoritized language vitality practitioners. Within our training sessions, we're, we like to try to partner to offer trainings on issues of language reclamation, specific skills, and cultural documentation. Our innovation kind of section, we're looking to develop scalable projects that could be used across different communities. So we're looking to uh, to see if there's any communities that are taking on unique and innovative ways to approach challenges that that multiple communities are facing within the changing world, um, and developing and, and understanding those projects and re researching them and and trying to get them to the point where they can scale to support other communities. Kind of our networking work, our goal of that is to uh, to find a way to use the Smithsonian or, or leverage uh, the institutional position of the Smithsonian and to connect people that we know who are doing language with resources that they may need we, within the Smithsonian. Um, we also try to connect uh, people together outside of us or independently. So uh, trying to make places where people can connect meet each other um, and, and really develop peer-to-peer uh, -peer relationships um, over this work. And then finally, um, our advocacy work, um, we're trying to engage with my majority language speakers on a local or a federal level to embrace unique voices and worldviews and, and really advocating for um, additive bilingualism. I'm gonna pass it over to Mary for this one. So we're going to now give you some concrete examples for each one of those. And if you haven't noticed already, like um, we're color coded on the pink <laughs> and Haley's the green teal color. <laughs> so this is my slide. Um, I, we'd like to talk about one, at least one of the trainings that we do that or that we help sponsor. And this is the what's called COLANG or the Institute on Collaborative Language Research. And I am putting um, the website link in the chat for you. So this is, um, the Colink has been going on since I think uh, 2008. I was first involved in 2010 and it goes every other year and it's at academic institutions so far around the United States because of the funding sources comes from National Science Foundation. And, but it's, it's really for training, uh, everybody, anybody who needs a kind of training. So a lot of community members come to take this kind of training. Students um, in academia, whether they're indigenous and minoritized or not, or, and also some professors actually go and get further training um, in uh, at Colang. So um, there's different kinds of courses. So everything from how to document and understand so kind of linguistics for community work. There's advocacy training. There are there's a lot of training for the kinds of uh, linguistic software that is out there as well. 
um, how to start language reclamation pro, uh, pro, uh, projects, how to develop materials, all of these kinds of things are taught at Colang. This last year was, it's on even number of years. So uh, 2022, it was at the University of Montana um, in collaboration with Chief Dole Knife College. And in 2024, it will be um, at the Arizona State University with the uh, Pima River Band, I think is the co -co the collaborator, uh, the co-sponsor with it. And, um, and there are definitely funding sources for community people who want to take um, to want to go to Colang, it is uh, it's two weeks long, and and there are funding sources. So we encourage you to go to the website and uh, to look to see about uh, the the kinds of scholarships that they have. And if that kind of training is of interest to you, I think it would be. <laughs> um, probably some of you out there have actually been to Colangs before. If you have, uh, put it in the chat, which maybe what year you went and stuff. Our dealings with Colang is, um, I was a facilitator instructor for many years, but, um, and, um, but what we did is we helped them actually create a website that would be across the different years and the different host institutions. So before, if you were looking for information on the web about Colang, you'd have to know where it was taught each year and it was really hard to find. And so this, um, we helped them to have their own platform so it's easier for you all to find them and to um, get more information about them. That's good. I see somebody uh, was there at Colang 2022. All right. <laughs> um, so innovation, this is kind of what we were talking about, about the supporting scalable projects and, and trying to find things, small projects that can impact a larger group. Um, this is a project that we, um, we took on with the Multicultural Institute and the, the Multicultural Institute of Advancement, Micah, um, with their Next Steps um, Indigenous Leader Training Program. They were looking for a way to train leaders in language reclamation in, uh, in advancing their project and their work. So in collaboration with Micah Smithsonian and uh, researcher Brittany McBeath, we did a did a series of of design and thought workshops to think through what what do language reclamation leaders need, what format would be most helpful for them, and what can they use to support their work independently um, or in small groups. And what we came out of this is is what was called the Wolf Who Walks Into World. It is a project guidebook. Thank you, Mary. Mary just put the link in the the chat if you guys need. This project, this is a self-reflection guidebook. So it's something that you can print off as a PDF um, and you can go through it independently, um, just you and yourself or as a group, as part of a group exercise. The goal of this workbook is to use, use activities that, that help you direct self-reflection towards your language work um, to kind of elicit what are some strategies, what are some goals, um, and what is kind of a path forward through the work that you're doing that makes most sense. We found it, I, I've found it to be extremely helpful within my own work, and I, I think Ma uh, Micah is, is now using it also, but but it's something that you can do independently. Um, it's written, we wrote that in, in 2021, um, and so we're hoping that uh, that it could be more useful for other people also. With networking, this is a, this is a project that that I'm I'm personally really excited about. It's the you know one of our goals within networking is to uh, use our institutional position, use the Smithsonian to better support the great work that Indigenous minoritized language leaders are doing, and we also want to create a place where people can can get to know each other and better connect over uh, over shared celebrations and, and shared things that they have found uh, within their work. One of the things that we're, we're, we're starting to do that may be helpful with this is uh, called the Language and Archives Mentorship Program. This is an open internship, so um, it's open for applications at any time. Um, it's an internship um, that you would take with the Smithsonian, and um, you, would be, you would be placed as an intern under us. And then the, the goal of this program is not necessarily that you would... Um, you know, take on work within the Smithsonian, but really we would work as research assistants to support you with ever, whatever goal it is that you would like to do within your internship. Um, so it's a three to four month time. Um, 
And, you know, a goal can be some goals in the past have been stuff like I know there's things in the Smithsonian that's related to my community um, and I just need help finding those records. Um, and so that's something that, that the Language and Archive Mentorship Program is meant to do. Um, you can sign up for an internship and um, we'll spend three to four months, about an hour a week, um, you know, looking through archives and trying to find those things. Um, there's a minimum time commitment on the on the internship that's um, that's five hours a week, but it's only one hour of contact meeting time. So you're able to do the rest of the four hours independently. We designed it this way. So understanding and recognizing that people have other jobs and work and, and stuff and that language may be a second or third thing that that you're taking on. Um, so we wanted something that you could do during lunch breaks or after work fairly easily. Um, it's also a fully digital internship, um, so there's no need to, uh, you don't, you do not need to be in the Washington DC area, you don't need to be in this time zone, you can be um, anywhere in the world, it's, it's also open globally. Um, so if you want more information about that program, it is, um, along with that, it is an unpaid internship, so there is no funding going towards this internship. But the goal of this internship is, is not necessarily that you um, our, our goal here is that we're just trying to use the, the, the function of the internship um, within like the Smithsonian organization to find a way to help equip you to do the stuff that you need. So it's, it's really focused on, on getting you the stuff that you need. Um, some other things that are, are the possibilities of different projects people have done within the LAMP program. Um, we had one team that came on as a group. So not, it wasn't just one person, but they, they signed up as a, as a group of of four people, um, three people, sorry, three people. And they um, they were looking to develop a community archive. And so we went through the Smithsonian archive and thought about how it's structured. And we went through a lot of design questions to help them get down to, to what they really meant by an archive and what they were hoping to create. Um, and then, then tried to put them in the right direction of, of platforms and places to go. Um, another, inter another LAMP internship project in the past has been um, someone knew that there were materials out there in the world um, uh, about their community and they needed help understanding how to reach out to different archives to get that information. So um, within, within that internship, we spent most of the time um, you know, finding where these materials are and then um, sitting down together and crafting effective emails to send out to different archivists and just trying to keep track of that paper trail and kind of uh, understanding you know the information that they were giving back to us what this means and, and kind of working forward with that um, right now we're working on another project with someone who is really interested in understanding copyright um, getting a better sense of that to make sure that they're um, they're correctly placing their information as they they talk about their community you know in a way that's that's um, that's that's equitable um, so yeah, it, it's really open for a lot of interpretation on that. So we're, we're really we're really excited to see where those will go. I have to say it's it's amazing. You get one on one time from Haley in in uh, in investigating your questions. So I think it's a really great deal. <laughs> Um, the next part is the advocacy. We're not going to spend as much time on this because this is really trying to educate the general public. I mean, as part of a museum, as part of the Smithsonian Institution, um, part of the larger mission is to educate the general public. And we feel the way we interpret that for a language vitality initiative is to really educate people on why all of the languages in the world and particularly in the Americas are important, are beautiful, need to be continued, need our support, everybody's support. Um, so one of the ways we do that is we have, um, the our center has a magazine, it's an online magazine, it's called Folk Life Magazine. And we've partnered with the Endangered Language Project, which is a, a collaboration between uh, First Peoples Cultural Council in Vancouver, uh, 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 Victoria, excuse me, uh, British Columbia, um, and the University of Hawaii. Um, and uh, we are working with them to, uh, to have a series of, of short stories uh, created by 
people who are actually working on language reclamation on the ground and how they do it and some of their challenges. Our first one came out, it's called, uh, the, our, the whole series is called A Stream of Voices. And our first one came out um, on Ayasa Ebu, which is a, a language spoken in Cameroon and a youth program that a young man started there in Cameroon. Uh, we have a couple other ones in the shoot from around the world. So if you're interested in being highlighted, um, uh, we'd like to talk to you as well. Um, the other one is the Smithsonian, um, well, here, this is the Smithsonian Mother Tongue Film Festival. Um, this is coming up at, at um, uh, Mother Language Day every year. This is on February 22nd. Um, and we have usually four to five days of, of films. Um, in uh, languages that are generally not represented and um, uh, in mass media and also a lot of indigenous films as well. Um, I always have one section on that focuses on language reclamation and language reclamation issues, so on language itself. Um, and this year we're, we're highlighting some youth films. We always like to see youth uh, shorts come in. Um, and we're also not um, picky about, you don't have to be a filmmaker. If you've made something um, uh, in your language or about your language that you want to share, um, send it to us. We don't really have, um, we don't have a cutoff date anytime. We kind of add it to our, um, our list um, and uh, you may be considered. You never know. <laughs> so, okay, next one. And then here's some other opportunities um, around the Smithsonian. Um, one of them is um, the Recovering Voices, which is a pro, uh, one of the research programs that's at the National Museum of Natural History. And, um, and um, they have a community research, community research grants. And these are the applications are over for this year. Um, but they're funding it for up to $10,000 to cover coming to Washington, D.C. and uh, working on a project that opens up the anthropology collections, the NMAI, National Museum of American Indian Collections, National Anthropological Archives, so language documentation as well. Um, if you go to their website, um, I'll, I'll put it in. I think this is going to come out. It might have a, might have, yeah, it's coming out kind of, there's something wrong with that. But anyway, um, uh, it gives you more information, but they really prefer um, to have a group of people um, come in with a specific project, as in we're really wanting to look at um, um, our, our traditional snowshoes and we're developing a curriculum about these. So we wanna look at how they were made. We, not all of our, information has been carried on. Um, we also want to look at the language that you might, documents that you might have at the same time and, and these kinds of, of things. So they really like these holistic approaches um, to have a couple people come. And they're really, really nice. They can cover about, nowadays we can cover about three three groups a year to come and we're just starting up again after, after COVID. Um, but those are really nice for people who want to do some really in-depth research here in Washington. Washington, D.C. Okay, and the next slide. Um, also, the National Museum of American Indian have some really wonderful internships. Um, again, uh, the, the, they have us more sliding when you, you can apply, I think, for those. I don't think we have an email for that right now. But if you just go to the National Museum of American Indian and go to internships, you'll find them. Um, you can do everything from, you know, working in administration to working in archives to working with objects to programming to working with the public. It, it is really varied uh, what you can do. And some of them have stipends, some of them don't. Um, so you'd have to just look through their list and see and, and contact people. That's one thing is always call people. You know, you will have our, Haley's on my email at the end. If you have questions about any of these programs or how to get in touch with somebody, just email us, um, we're available, so. Yeah, and this is something that I think um, Mary and I are really excited to, to, to partner with a, &A for. Um, 
this is this is kind of a, a we're very excited to announce the, um, that that we're working with ANA to support a new project called the Language Reclamation Landscapes. Um, this is going to be um, this is specifically for um, ANA grantees. So this is specifically for if you've received an ANA um, ANA grant that's still active, um, you'll be you'll be getting more information about this in the coming weeks. Um, but the language reclamation landscape is a series of interactive, what we're calling them visits to panoramic topics in language reclamation. Um, we want to, we wanted to create a place where, you know, where we can have some online collaborative learning around different topics that everyone is um, addressing within language. Um, some of these topics, I'll go to the next screen to show you. Um, and we're not, um, we're hoping that we're designing these to be more of chats and more of um, collective learning. Um, so we'll have two uh, panelists every month um, that will be, you know, experts in the field that will be, you know, kind of leading these discussions and and will be there and present to answer any questions. Um, Mary and I will also be there along with a Carly Tex um, of ACLES to to kind of go through and, and think about things and, and help. Um, problem solve on these different topics, but um, the goal is to not make a path through these as much as, you know, make sure that we're supporting you guys and giving um, the information that you guys need or the information that, that we can give you guys on, on these different topics. Um, is there anything else on that, Mary, that you wanted to, to highlight? Um. Not really. I, I mean, I, I think um, some people may be on the call that may not get the invitation because these were developed specifically for um, um, some of the awardees. Um, I'm forgetting the name, the American. Uh, anyway, there's a new a new sub awardees of ANA, um, and and so it was kind of developed with them in mind. Um, hopefully, it'll go really well, and we will be invited back, and we can do it um, a, a little bit larger to um, um, other grantees as well. So, yeah. thank you, Lucy. We're excited about it too. <laughs> Um, so I, one more part, point on this is that the first one is going to be February 16th, so they're coming up. So um, within the next week, um, um, your ANA representatives will be sending out a little bit more about this program. Um, oh yeah, yes, they will oh. be open. Um, and that that's the that's the end of our show here. Um, we 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 wanted to cover. I think we we talked a little bit about the, the four big things that we think that our work really connects with. Um, so that's the um, signing up for Colang, or if that's something that interests you guys. Uh, we talked a little bit about downloading the, the Wolf Who Walks in Two Worlds uh, PDF for self-reflection, um, just to kind of get some journaling and strategy going for stuff. Uh, we talked a little bit about signing up for the Language and Archives Mentorship Program, if, if there's a project that you, you feel like you could get some direct help with. Um, uh, what, else, what else did we talk? Oh yeah, Mother Tongue Film Festival, if you want to submit anything. And uh, if you feel like your community is doing something great that you want to celebrate uh, and want to, in, in written form, um, you can you can reach out to us for, for writing something. Um, and then we talked a little bit about, about the updating up um, the new, new web series. And um, I guess the, with that, are, do you guys have any questions for for Mary or, or me on, on what we've done? You can either unmute, I don't know if you can, or I don't know how this Zoom is set up, but if you wanna unmute yourself and, and let us know or uh, write in the chat and we can read it out. Will this presentation be available after, after available after the Zoom? Will this recording be sent out? I believe, uh, I believe that it will. I believe that it will, that um, you may need to talk to Annie about this. When are decisions given from the LAMP program? Uh, the decisions for the um, for the LAMP, so the LAMP is a, is a rolling internship program. Um, it's three to four months um, and you, know, you can apply anytime. Um, it usually takes us about two to three weeks to process. For, once you submit, it'll probably take us two or three weeks to write, to, to read it. And um, if you're applicable, then, you know, get back to you and start scheduling things. Um, right now, um, the LAMP program is booked until the beginning of March. Um, we're kind of full up with positions, but we can start anyone after, after the beginning of the March. 
if you're interested in applying um, competitive, you're going to have to write, um, it's going to ask you a lot of questions and, and feel free to reach out to me with an email directly if you're interested with that. Um, and I can kind of walk you through this process. It's going to, um, applying for the internships is going through this, you know, global Smithsonian system, which it's very easy to get lost in. Um, so I got some, some tips and stuff to help you guys out to get through that a little bit easier. Um, the main thing that we're looking for within a LAMP application is the personal statement essay. This is a one to two page document where you're really telling us what we're really interested in understanding is who, um, what community are you from? Um, and what's the status of the language? Um, what we're really interested in, the, the key point I think is where we make our decisions is how will the work that you're doing with LAMP um, support existing work that's already happening in the community. Um, so if you can, you can talk about those two things in your own, ex and then finally, um, what's your position within the language community? Um, or what, or how long have you been learning or just kind of giving us a scope of, of where you are with on your language journey is also super helpful for us. Um, so yeah. um, I wanted to add, I think Robert had a question there. Um, the the summer internships refer to internships for people who want to help out with the folk life festival, and um, and those had the March have the March fifteenth deadline. But the lamp, um, uh, it's as as Haley said, it's rolling, so you can apply at any time. Um, I had to be a little protective of her time, so she can, she so she um can do usually one internship at a time. And so what we do is like we have one and then we have another one starting when the other one is finishing and we try to do it that way. Given uh, that depends on the scope of each project she takes on, each each intern group or intern she takes on, how many we can fit in in a year. Um, last year, I think on the first year, I think you did four, maybe five. Five, yeah. Five. So yeah. Um, so so, but it's rolling. So go ahead and and apply and as and talk to Haley about it as well. So. Um, I, I think some people are asking about uh, the link to the YouTube where these will be later. I think Car uh, Mia will need to do that because we uh, we don't have that link. But I'm sure it'll get up there um, or be sent to you in your email. So, yes, we only have emails for all the A and A recipients. Um, so I'll try to find the link that will <laughs> okay. really for the ACF YouTube page. That it'll okay. really get. we have to make everything because we're a federal agency. What's called 508 compliance. So basically. Um, for visually impaired folks, they will be able to see the transcript. So um, once that process is complete, we can post it. Yep. Oh, oh, sorry, more questions. Uh, if we are unsure about what sorts of items the Smithsonian Archives have on our culture and languages, who may we contact to look into that from Eli? Um, Eli, you could you can contact me. Um, so um, I'll put my email in. Oh, look, I'll just type type my email into the chat right now. So this is something, Eli. This is something that is a great project for a LAMP program. Um, we are able to to go through you know the different search interfaces together of the Smithsonian to just see if um, see what we can find. Um, so that's if you want to do if. If, if you find things and, and you know there are things and you want to kind of get those organized in together. Um, Eli, if you're interested and you're just not quite sure where to start, you're welcome. I'm, I'm open for everyone. If, if anybody wants to just uh, find an hour one day um, and, you know, I can help you guys do some searches to even just start to see if there's anything worth filling out a LAMP internship application to start looking at. Um, so yeah, you can you can reach out directly to us, and then we can find some time to work together. Um, or um, uh, or or you know, if if we do find something, it'll be a bigger project. But um, if you don't want to talk to us, that's also great. There's uh, if Mary, Mary, do you want to talk a little bit about the? I, the I, it's not that you don't want to talk to us. No, no. Like, if, yeah, you're, totally, yeah. if you're very comfortable with um, search engines and and stuff, um, I did put the kind of the general 
uh, first place to start when you're looking in Smithsonian collections. Um, and it's fairly easy to use. And it also, for those of you with more experience, you can go in and you can say, like, I'm looking for um, Ponca materials, um, language materials, any kind of recording. You can, you can, you know, tailor it down. Because uh, if you just put in, for example, Ponca tribe of Oklahoma, you're going to get a huge amount of stuff, probably. Um, so, but that is a place to start if you're just curious. But, um, um, but yeah, actually going in and really digging and seeing what's in those and stuff. Um, uh, you can contact if you're looking at the, you know, the, the thing about the Smithsonian is we're trying to show is that it's really spread out. Like you could go to an archivist at the National Anthropological Archives. There's there, horribly understaffed. <laughs> so it may be a while before they get back to you. Um, you know, but that might not be where this stuff is actually held. It might be some, someplace else. So that's one thing about the LAMP program, you know, or asking Haley, like, we can kind of like help you out with this process. Okay, since I hadn't known how many things the Smithsonian offered, how can we get more information on the other sections within cultural vitality if we have possible interests that align with them? Um, are you talking about, um, uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Or, you know, another way to is just send us an email and then I can connect you guys and maybe we have a conversation and I can connect you with, um, with I, I'm not sure if you're talking about cultural industries or our um, indigenous media, but um, I, if, if you just reach out to us, then I can, I can try my best to connect you to either of those things if you like, Eli. We also have a few minutes. Um, I know there had been a request before to kind of show our web page and kind of show how to navigate. So we can get off of this and Haley, if you want to put up the, um, maybe start reading with folk, folk life. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, we can kind of show you how to navigate our web page. Yeah. And again, like if you, <laughs> Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage has one web page. The National Museum of American Indian has another web page. They are not connected, okay? And the National Anthropological Archives has another web page. They are not connected. They're, we're all our own entities, so that's another problem. But anyway, this is the if you just if you remember Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, and that's all you remember, um, uh, you can get to our our department's main page and this is what it looks like and, and feel free to reach out to us if you get lost and um, we're, we're happy to help you guys um, mm -hmm. so if you go to this if you type in cult, uh, cfch or center for folk life you'll end up here um, if you scroll down here you can see all of the other some of the great things that we do um, you can either click on here to get there but i find the best way to get to our site is up here if you go to the the hamburger at the top right when you click that drop down, um, it'll show it'll show all the different departments of um, the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. So we're under Cultural Vitality, and then right here you'll find Language Vitality. And if you click here, um, this has a lot of information on it. It um, kind of gives us the the you know our our, um, our spiel on what we do. Um, it also gives all of our email addresses and our, our you know, our contact information if you want to reach out to some of us. Um, kind of gives, you know, a concept of what we just talked about a little bit. And then uh, if you scroll down to this project area, you can see a little bit more about each one of the projects that we're working on. Um, we're doing more projects than we mentioned today, and we'd love to have enough time to talk to you guys about these and, and mention more things. Or we'd love for you guys to just you know, see our, our site and go check out what we're doing. Um, but yeah, so this is how you would find things like the, the stream of voices um, uh, that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, this is, you we also have a link to the, the Wolf Who Walks in, in Two Worlds um, to download that. So yeah, do you have any other questions? Thank you, Jeremiah. That's that's nice. Yes, um, I've done this a couple times before at Mia's request, and um, uh, it's always nice to uh, you know have contact with y'all and you know kind of share what we're doing because people don't know. And 
uh, there's a lot out there nowadays and it's hard to sift through everything. So it helps if you have a, you know, faces with names and kind of have a better understanding. So it's our pleasure. Mia, did you have any questions for us or, or something that you would like us to further cover within this presentation? Nothing specific. I um, just want to thank you for this presentation. My mother spent 40 years working for the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. And um, I knew about these resources, but it didn't click to me until we had an American Rescue Plan a meeting that I was like, oh, wow, we've got just down the street, a lot of resources and knowledgeable people who can help our tribes and Native organizations preserve their languages. So that kind of propelled into this uh, upcoming series that we're going to be doing over the next eight months um, that we're really excited about. So we really want to help all of our recipients engage and learn from each other, as well as develop their own internal abilities to do this native language work rather than uh, having to defer to outsiders because uh, we want to build capacity. So thank you all for getting us started with this. I'm seeing in the chat, um, Camille uh, asked the question, who can I reach out to for photo research? Um, I'm assuming that that you, what you're asking there is you, you're trying to find research, um, you're trying to find photographs within the Smithsonian about about your community or a topic of interest. Again, feel free to send me an email about that. And um, I'm happy to schedule an hour sometime for us to just kind of poke and hope and try to find something. And we feel like this is something that's a little bit too big for just an hour, then, then we can start the conversation of whether or not we want to make do a LAMP internship around this. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out to me with my email address on the screen, dardarh at si.edu, and we can find a time to try to start looking for those things. Uh, Charmaine Baker is on. She was part of, I think, the 2019 National Breath of Life. So she came here. And among many things I think that she found were historical maps that were very important to her and um, and her people in, in reclaiming those yeah so so you never know what you're going to find and they're all it's all very important so great well thank you guys so much for your time today thank you yes. okay thank you all